Okay, for this lecture we're going to pick up pretty much where we left off with the other one. Uh, but I'm going to use a different kind of strategy. Uh, those ones were pretty formal. I, I scripted everything out so that I can make captions. Uh, this one I'm going to try uh, more off the cuff. So we're going to start off with transfer of internal energies. Uh, we mentioned these last times. We have conduction, convection, and radiation. <laughs> and uh, we should be able to go through each of them in some detail to give you an idea of what's taking place. We're going to start with conduction. And conduction is really most pertinent when we have uh, not the, the exchange of particles, but when we have particles bouncing into other particles. So for instance, let's say that I have a container. And I'll make it just a nice little container here. So here's one container. and we'll attach it to another container. So that they're pressed right up against each other. Okay? And what's going on is, is this one is going to have pretty high energy particles in it. And so we're going to have some particles in here. And we'll put some particles in this one as well. And what's going to take place is these ones, because they're high energy, they're going to be sort of going in all sorts of different directions in terms of their, their initial velocities. And you'll notice that this one here in particular, and probably this one too, if we follow its path, it's going to actually bounce off the surface. It'll bounce off the surface, bang into this one, and so on, back around. And what's going to take place is that these particles are going to bang into this surface over here. And initially, these guys, being at a lower temperature, are going to be moving somewhat sluggishly. Maybe you have one fastest one in there. But these ones, moving quickly, bang into the interface between them. And really, you have to realize that what's really taking place is that at this interface, there is a particle, more likely than not, uh, which makes up the end of this container. So you have this high-speed particle come in and bump into this particle right here. And when it bumps into that particle, that particle, if it's free to move, might start moving. If it's not free to really move a lot, then what it might do, though, is it, it might bump into another particle inside of this container that is more free to move. So even if, let's just say these are liquids inside of here, so I have two containers filled with liquids with kind of a solid surface um, as the container. These particles here in the water bang into the container side. Those particles then bang into the particles of the other container, which then sort of jiggle and vibrate the particles inside of this low temperature chamber. And that's conduction in a nutshell. It's the transfer of energy from one place to another through contact, through collisions. And that's pretty much exactly what I have outlined here. Transfer of heat due to temperature differences. Well, all heat is transferred due to temperature differences. Um, but it's this part is the, the unique part, through collisions of molecules or electrons. So th basically, through the, the direct interaction, of the materials of one um, object with the materials of another object. Uh, good electrical conductors, such as metals, are good thermal conductors for the exact same reason. They have these free electrons that are free to, to bounce around and bang into other things. And, and really, by that mobility, transfer heat uh, throughout the material. Which is why if you take like a, a spoon, a metal spoon, and, and put it in a pot of boiling water, the end of the spoon is going to get hot pretty quickly. But if you use wood, the same thing doesn't quite happen. Uh, air and gases in general are good insulators. The reason for this is because the particles are, are really just too far apart. They're not dense enough to get a large number of collisions taking place. And just to get an idea of what the uh, conduction, the conductivity looks like for different particles. I'm going to follow this link and show you some examples. So this site is called um, Hyperphysics and it has lots of different resources. 
And we're going to look at the thermal conductivity. You could look at it in terms of calories and seconds and that kind of thing. But generally speaking, because we're in physics, we'll do watts uh, per meter Kelvin. Uh, so it's really looking at how much energy is transferred, the rate of the energy transfer, and the compared to the distance over which it's being transferred and the temperatures that are involved. And you see that diamond's very, very conductive. And the reason, of course, is because it's so dense. It's pretty much the opposite reason of why air is a, a bad conductor. Diamond is very dense, and so you're able to transfer the energy very eff effectively. And you can look and see you have your good uh, electrical conductors, silver, copper, gold, are also good thermal conductors. And then the numbers drop off pretty dramatically, where you get to ice and glass and concrete, not nearly so good conductors. Asbestos, no surprise, very, very low thermal conductivity, which is good if you're using it for the heat-resistant purpose. Um, fiberglass, also used as an insulator, so it makes sense that that's low. You see brick, not quite so low, not nearly so low compared to fiberglass. Um, insulating brick you see is lower. Cork, wool felt, um, and then you get into some plastics, and you see air is also very, very low um, as far as thermal conductors go. Wood, pretty good. Pretty good as, as far as resisting the conduction of heat. Now, rate of conduction uh, really has a lot of important implications for our everyday life. For instance, although this isn't necessarily everyday life, you've probably seen people walk across hot coals, seen video of it, that, that type of thing. Well, coal is not a great conductor of heat. It's not a poor conductor of heat, per se, but it's not a great conductor either. And so you're able, as long as you don't spend very much time on any given coal, you're not able to allow the heat to transfer very effectively. It could still hurt, but as long as you move quickly and deliberately enough, you're going to be okay. Though don't try it at home. And I'd like to compare that to hot steel walking. This would be a terrible, terrible idea because steel will conduct the heat to your feet very, very rapidly and you'll get terrible burns. So that's why you don't see people hot steel walking because it's not a good idea. Uh, some other examples. Uh, cold tile versus cold carpet. If you're in your home, probably maybe your, your bedroom is, is carpeted and then the bathroom maybe has tile. And especially now with how cold it is, you might feel like, well, you can walk barefoot on the carpet, but when you get to the tile, it's really, really cold. The truth of the matter is, is that because both are in your home, they're actually both probably right about the same temperature. The difference is in our perception, and this is why our perception is so faulty as far as temperature is concerned, because the temperature should be identical. The difference, though, is the rate of conduction. So cold carpet doesn't conduct heat away from your body very effectively. Cold tile, much higher conductivity, is much more effective at conducting heat away from you. Uh, also, hot foil and hot potatoes. So, one thing that you'll notice is that when you, if you ever wrap a potato in foil, put them in the oven, they're going to be the same temperature when you bring them out. But the foil will conduct, let's say you remove the hot potato from the foil, the foil will conduct the heat away very, very rapidly from itself. So you can touch the foil within seconds after removing it, and it seems like it's, it's room temperature. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it's, it's very low mass, uh, but also it's just very effective at conducting elect er, heat. The hot potato, on the other hand, if you stick your finger inside of the potato a couple seconds after it's removed from the oven, it will burn you severely. Why? Because it's a better... Well, actually, it's a worse conductor of heat. So it doesn't cool down nearly as effectively prior to you putting your finger in it. And the last example here is dry ice versus dry ice with a penny. Now, it's actually possible to touch dry ice to hold it in your hand, that type of thing. Not for very long. Uh, but you can touch it, and it, it doesn't freeze your, your finger too badly. However, if you have the very clever idea, which, which I had, at one point, which is to use a penny in between your finger and the dry ice, what happens is the penny, being such a great conductor, 
conducts the heat out of your finger much more rapidly and conducts it into the dry ice much more rapidly. So you get one of the worst pains that you'll ever experience um, if you do this type of an experiment. I don't recommend it. Okay, just to quickly finish up conduction, here's an equation. You don't really need to know it, uh, but there are some important points in it. The rate at which the heat is transferred, which is this delta Q over delta T, is dependent on a couple of factors. First of all, it's dependent on the temperature difference between the two areas uh, where you're interested in conducting energy to and from. The greater the temperature difference between those areas, areas the faster heat will be conducted. This L represents the distance between those two areas. So if you're heating one end of a metal rod, or a, a spoon, let's say, and your spoon happens to be very short, the other end's going to get hot pretty quick. If it's long, it's going to take longer for the other end to get hot. And this A is the cross-sectional area. And you can imagine that if you have a, a larger area, there's going to be a greater possibility of collisions between the two sides. Uh, so you'll get a much more uh, effective transfer of energy through conduction.